folkies! Emily Valken here and in this Scandi Folk Nerd video we're going to talk about Swedish folk vaults. So as usual those videos are generalizations about big topics and I am human, thus I'm perfect. So what I say is not to be taken as the encyclopedia but as just a bunch of tips and tricks to understand and play the Swedish vaults. Um, so this being said, let's get into it. Vals, when it was invented in the beginning of the 19th century, was a huge, huge success. So this idea of a couple dance, which is pretty quick, which is on a 3-4 uh, time uh, signature music, just had an enormous success. And it spread all across Europe, and then further away across the seas and in different parts of the globe. But what is important to understand is that even if the basis was the same, people who adopted it as a part of their own music um, modified it. So they adapted it to their own tastes, habits, traditions, instruments, fashions. So it become, became very varied, like it has many variations. And uh, that's why a Swedish waltz is different from a Bulgarian waltz or a Portuguese waltz and things like that. So here I'm going to talk about the Swedish folk vals, and I say folk especially because uh, I don't know if you know the other uh, traditional dance and music scene in Sweden, gambal dance. Uh, there are probably others, but for now those are the two ones that I want to talk about, folk music and gambal dance. Those are very close and sometimes they are like even mixing together, but on some points they differ. And from what I know of gambal dance, which is super tiny, <laughs> Um, their way of playing a waltz is different from the folk music way of playing waltz. So that's why I say Swedish folk waltz, because we're not going to talk about the gamel dance waltz. So, how to play Swedish folk waltz? Well, this question is not very easy to answer to. Because, um, unlike Polska, waltz doesn't have a very specific bowing pattern or a very nerdy ornament that is like really really typical. It is more about the feeling and feeling is hard to practice technically speaking. So what we're gonna do is not to focus on one melody or one bowing pattern but try to go deeper and understand like the general schema, the general pattern of the energy of the music. So the first thing you need to know and remember at all times is that your most important thing is the one. The one is big and heavy. So when I mean heavy, um, I mean the direction of the energy. This might sound a bit esoteric maybe, but basically you know there are some dances that are going very much up, like I don't know, reels or Basque Fandango for example, it's very jumpy, but there are also dances and Scandi dances are usually like that, that are going down. The energy is this direction. And this is especially the case for vals. Vals is really going down. And um, it's heavy. I mean, once I explained it to kids and I said that it was the vals of the elephants, which is very much exaggerated, but you get the idea. It's heavy, heavy, heavy. It's still graceful, don't get me wrong. It is graceful, it is beautiful, but it's heavy. So you really want to go down, into the floor. Dig into that floor, folkies. So, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I highly encourage you to stomp and move your body on what we're going to do because it can help you a great deal to understand those uh, concepts of energy and movement up and down and stuff like that. Once your one is really there in your head, you can add a little bit of three, and then it's a bit like Polska. You are putting a bit of heaviness on the three as well. Not as much as on the one, maybe half of it, kind of, one third of it, depends a bit. You can stomp the three as well. A uh, little parenthesis about stomping, there are people in Sweden who stomp only the one on valses, that's my case. There are people who stomp three and one, both are done, both are fine, so do as you prefer. But basically you're gonna add a little uh, three and a little bit of weight on the three as well. So you have this heavy one which is a bit like throwing a rubber ball to the floor and comes slowly up because there is gravity you know. And then you add a little. So if I draw a curve with my hand it's gonna be 
one, three and one, three, one, three, one, three. Actually, the curve, if you are more a visual person, that's your curve. One, three, one, three. I'm gonna use that again later. Um, now let's do it with the bow in hand. One, three, one, three, one, three. Okay? And now let's do it on strings. Let's take the D and G open strings on our fiddles and or in other instruments, no matter. And when we want it very heavy, we're gonna play the two strings together. And when we want it a bit less heavy, we're gonna play just on the G. Like this. Two strings, one string, two string, one string. In one, like every bar, is in one bow. One, three, one, three, one, three, one, three. You might notice that my hand is doing exactly what it did before without the bow in it. It's exactly the same movement. So that's the basic of your energy and your swing for Swedish balls. So practice that a lot, that is my advice. Practice, practice this a lot and especially practice it in between different uh, tunes, in between times that you're playing a tune. Play this uh, curve stuff and then play your tune once through and then play the curve again and then play the tune again. So if you alternate between those two, your brain is going to understand that the feeling of the, the curve should be brought to the melody. And once this is done, you basically have the good energy of the valse. You have understood the swing of it. You're done. Bye. Don't have anything to say. No, okay. There are more things to say. Um, but that's basically the basic of the thing. So really practice on that. And the bonus is, this is something you can practice alone. But it's also a super good like riff to accompany someone who is playing the melody. Of course, you will have to change the notes, not just D and D. But it, you can just play that and it's gonna work very fine on a melody most of the time. Now there is one little fellow we haven't talked about yet, which is the beat number two. And we're gonna talk about it, but I just want to add a nerdy bracket about uh, rhythmical underdivisions. So if you're not into that, just don't listen for a minute. I'm back to you in a second. But basically the two, you have two tendencies on where to put it. So you can have a straight valse, which is basically when you have Tum ti ta ki tum ti ta ki tum ti ta ki tum. It's really straight. The two is on its place, at its place. Um, the tum being the one, obviously. Um, and you can also have a variation of the rhythm where the two is actually a bit late. Basically, the one is dotted, like this. Tum ti ta ki tum ti ta ki tum ti ta ki tum. So if I sing two times the first one, two times the second one, you'll understand the difference. Hear the difference? So that's a little nerdy stuff that you can also explore if you want. You can adapt your curve to that. It will be a little different, but similar to what we have already seen, but a bit more precise. And you can also check which part of which tune is doing which one of those two characteristics. Sometimes it's very clear, sometimes it's a bit like, oh, don't know. But that's an interesting thing to dig into, if you like this kind of stuff. I do. Now let's close the bracket and go back to uh, a bit easier stuff about the beat number two. Basically, you have maybe noticed on my beautiful piece of carton um, <laughs> that the two is going actually a bit up. Yes, it is. The one is down, the three is down, and the two is pretty much a bit up. But now I'm saying careful. Meep, 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 meep. All your lights are red now. Careful, careful. It's going up the two because it has to. Because we want to go down on the three and on the one again a lot. So we need to get up a bit at some point, and it's on the two. Just like <gasps> breathing. A bit like your ball, your rubber ball is coming up from the ground to be able to go down again, you know? But we are not putting any energy going that direction. Mm -mm. We are still aiming down, 
but we need a bit of breathing, kind of. So you are not gonna follow this pattern. You are not gonna follow that pattern. You're not gonna do one, two, three, and one, two, three, and uh -uh. I don't want to see that. I don't want to hear that. You are gonna do the two like a breathing. One, three, and one, three, one, three. You see the difference? You don't put any energy going up. Your focus is not up. It's just flowing to fall again. Very important. Very, very important. So keep that in mind. And now I want to go into uh, how to accompany, um, how to play an accompaniment to a mel valse melody, a Swedish valse melody. And here, actually, this fact of not putting up on the two is really, really crucial. And I want to insist on that because there is one pattern of accompaniment that is used on many different types of valse and it fits perfectly on many of them. Sadly, it doesn't on Swedish folk valse. This is the pattern that I call boom, chak, chak, boom, chak, chak, boom, chak, chak, boom, chak, chak. You probably know what I mean <laughs> with that boom, chak, chak. Um, it's very used in uh, Viennese vowels, like in Viennese type classical vowels, but also in like French musette vowels and so on. And it fits totally fine for those. But it doesn't, with, it doesn't fit with uh, Swedish folk vowels at all. If you play this kind of accompaniment on a Swedish vowels, it just doesn't sound the style, like the Swedish style at all. You're just killing its Swedishness. <laughs> sad, really sad thing. Uh, this is something I've heard being done especially by accordion players. So dear accordion players, please, please, even if it's an easy pattern to play for you, even if you're very used to play it on other types of valses, for Swedish folk valse, do not. Please, never ever boom chak chak. Okay? So what to play instead of that? Well, you have several possibilities. You can play very easily on just the one. This is always gonna be fine. It works especially well if you play a pit instrument, like double bass with pizzicato. Works super nice on the one. Gives you all the heaviness you need on that one. So you can play something like... And as you see, you can put or not the curvy stuff. I would recommend you to put it because it adds even more like uh, characteristic, like typical Swedish uh, swing to your uh, accompaniment, but you don't have to. Depends also if you have a bow or not. Um, then you can also spice it a bit, make it more interesting with adding some tr some three, actually. Usually it leads very well like to the next bar, something like... <laughs> as well on like almost every valse if not all of them um, and then you can also actually add the two so play just all beats quarter notes all, all around um, just be careful to not put energy up on the two as for like as we said before just uh, especially if you're playing a kind of arpeggios or uh, chords do not put like boom body dum body dum body because that's really leaning close to pum chak chak you might manage to do it without the pum chak chak feeling but it's a bit dangerous so maybe try to consider the the accompaniment you're playing more like a bass line than as chords and then you can really write almost like a melody, uh, like third or fourth voice that is really like a bass line, really nice sounding and totally fitting the style, something like You can link them in one bow, like bind them, or you can separate them depends how you want to sound, depends the instrument you're playing, and so on and you can play around having sometimes all three beats, sometimes just the one, sometimes the two, playing the curvy stuff or not. So you have a lot of freedom with just those things. Basically think as a, a bass line, really. Like not chords, but bass line. So that's about accompanying the Swedish vowels. But yeah, okay, but what about the melody? <laughs> as I said, it's very hard to give like 
very practical tips for playing the melodies uh, right. If you have the curve in your head and in your movements, it's pretty much there, it's pretty much in place. Um, what I can tell you though is to try to consider your Swedish valves as a river. I like this metaphor because I think it gives lots of good images, um, especially the fact that you know it's a joyful river flowing downhill, so you're going down. It's um, full of energy, it's really motivated to go down, I said it's joyful, it's, it's a very motivated river and also um, it gives you the two characteristics that you can work on in your playing. One of them is that you don't want to sound sharp, so you're not gonna play you're gonna play yum di la di da la di da la da la di do. So you're gonna bind your notes a bit together. Of course, this is easier on some instruments than some others. If you have a percussive instrument or like uh, plug strings, it's harder. But that's basically the idea of it: that you are gonna have all your molecules of water hanging together and flowing together in a direction. Not just drops that are falling, but it's a whole flow of water. So having things clinging together and going together somewhere. And then the other um, axis that you can focus on is, okay, things flowing together, but I don't want it to be too cheesy. Vowels by itself, like almost by definition, has a tendency to sound a bit cheesy. Uh, and if you're like me, you don't like cheesy. <laughs> so you are gonna work on, okay, no notes being together, going together, but still being interesting and special having a spark, having texture, and like it's like your river. Your river is not flat, it has waves, it has little drops of water springing, um, it has leaves and branches that it's carrying with it, and pebbles and bubbles and all that. So you can try to not make it sharp, still not sharp, but make it textured. So in between those two things, you can really navigate, sorry, um, and find a good a fitting style in between those two things. They are not opposed to each other, but they are different axes in a way. So, of course, it depends on the instrument you're playing, it depends on the melody itself, how it sounds. Is it like more melancholic or is it like a furious valse? Yes, there are some. Um, is it in major or minor? Major usually sounds way cheesier, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and also, what is your own taste? How do you want to sound like? Do you want to sound more like this or more like that? How do you like it? So explore that. And as usual, my general tip about that, and about the curve and the accompaniments, especially the curve, is to just record yourself. So play and record yourself and listen and analyze what you're playing. Don't focus too much on the technique. This is just something you're solving with time and practice but focus on the feeling. How is it? it? Am I really going down on my one? Am I doing a bit quick quick on my two and three, like boom, jack, jack or not? Try to be like critical and but nice to yourself, but critical. That's the best way to go further. So um, this is the end of the video. I hope you got some useful tips. I hope you're gonna have a lot of fun trying to really dig into the vowels of Sweden, Swed Swedish folk vowels. Um, I'm not gonna give you any tune, because now I give them in Scanny Folk Tunes videos. You already have one vowels, there is another one coming and more later on. Um, of course, vowels is not easy to understand, I know that. If you have questions, just write to me. Also, if you have critics, comments, suggestions, whatever, I'll try to answer my best. Um, that's it, basically. <laughs> Remember, no poop chak chak ever. <laughs> and have very much fun playing. Bye, folkies!